Yeah, so um, there's a kind of brief intro. The focus of my thesis originally, I should clarify, I'm in my, uh, my third year part-time, so kind of halfway through my, my PhD at the minute, um, was to re-examine the lower to middle Paleolithic transition with specific reference to Central Europe. Um, however, following kind of discussions with my supervisor, probation review, and discovering that my wife wouldn't be massively happy if I went to Germany for six months, and left her with the children, um, I decided to, to tweak the, the focus of my research. And as such, um, this, kind, this project was born. And um, the plan is to use agent-based modeling to look at why or how the uh, help understand the lower to middle Paleolithic transition with specific reference to Central Europe. Um, so why this one? Well. Um, I'll talk about that in a second, and then um, hopefully what happened during the lower to middle Paleolithic transition, my ideas, and then how agent-based modelling can help. Um, so the lower to middle Paleolithic transition, um, as the quote says, is marked by technical, behavioural and anatomical changes amongst the hominin population um, in Africa and Eurasia. But whilst this is a quite an accurate description, I think, of the, of the transition, it doesn't really tell the whole story. Um, we're still quite wedded, I think, when we think about the lower to middle Paleolithic transition, um, quite wedded this idea of a linear technological evolution, so a progression from Ashley into Lavalois with increasing complexity, um, and uh, an assumption, essentially, that it happens the same everywhere. Um, and this is partly because it's been a fairly poorly researched um, time period um, in the past and is only kind of recently gathering um, gathering steam. Um, some recent papers in the last kind of three or four years have, um, have really focused on trying to understand the transition in a different way um, in the Levant and Northern Europe and Western Europe. Um, so yeah, the main reason I was interested is because um, I find it fascinating. It's the kind of, I think, it gives us the opportunity to to challenge traditional ideas of um, human evolution and uh, kind of trait list approaches to modern human behaviour. Um, and hopefully there is a chance for us to use uh, computer models, particularly ABM, to, to understand what might have happened in the period um, and also move towards this kind of appreciation that it doesn't happen the same everywhere. Um, so traditionally, um, the lower to middle Paleolithic transition has been um, defined in kind of technological practice terms as a move from um, Ashley and hand axe production um, to Lavalois um, stone tool production. So work by um, Hopkinson and also by White and Ashton has looked at how um, and a change uh, stone tool production changed from having uh, discrete technolog technological practices. So we have fascinage, which is the, um, the reduction of a, a stone core with the core being the end product, and debitage, which is the removal of flakes from a core with the flakes being the intended end product, to a, um, a combination of the two um, in the middle, early middle Paleolithic, um, typified by Lavalois. Um, production. So what we see essentially is a move from two discrete production strategies um, to one. So a change, a fairly kind of hefty change in technological practice. So where did it happen? Well, this map um, is a really horrible reference covering the bottom of it. Um, it's quite a good example of um, is an excellent depiction of where you see um, late Ashley and, and early Lavawa, and what you notice is it's a fairly big um, space in Central Europe, um, with a few sites appearing in kind of um, Germany and then across um, across east. But there's not really been a lot of work done, and the sites that are there are fairly um, are either excellent um, or very poor in terms of there's only a couple of lithics um, that have been recovered. Um, but what you can see quite clearly is that it's not the same as the rest of Europe or Africa. There's no 
it doesn't fit with this uh, traditional idea of a kind of a sweeping spread of technological practice moving forward. So what we see in Central Europe um, is, let's say, interesting industries which don't fit this narrative. So um, Virtusolos, which is down here in Hungary, um, Bilchingsleben, Markiburg and Schöningen, which are in this group of sites up here, and uh, Rosemitze and a couple of others over here in Poland, um, names of which I'm not going to attempt to pronounce. Um, all date between 400 and 200,000 years ago. So right in the kind of the accepted boundary period for the lower to middle transition. Um, what they all have though is they all have an absence of hand axes um, and actually in technology either completely or they make up a very tiny proportion of the lithic assemblages and they also have an absence of prepared core technology. So what essentially happens in these sites is they seem to stick with fairly simple debitage um, stone tool production. So they're just knocking flakes off and using the flakes. Now, I was curious as to why, why this happens. Um, so if we accept that it's not the same everywhere, um, can we consider the transition as a local phenomena? Um, and if so, what can we use to understand this local phenomena? So, a lot of work's been done um, recently by a couple of people, Adler um, in 2014 and Primo in 2012, looking at this and highlighting this, um, this asynchronous um, and nature of the, the kind of transition across Western Europe, but nothing so far in Central Europe. And um, work by Primo has highlighted that even when you do see novel, novel technological attributes appearing in the early middle Paleolithic, um, particularly, they don't persist. I mean, you can see this through the archaeological record. So you can see um, blade technology appearing in Kenya 500,000 years ago, but it doesn't persist. Um, so it appears for a little while in the archaeological record, and then it disappears. And what I'm really interested in is trying to figure out why, why doesn't it persist? So we can see this stuff happening, and it's obviously not a, um, it's not an evolutionary, um, it's not an evolution problem. So they're technically capable of making this stuff, but it's not persisting where it does originate. Um, yeah, essentially, why, why is it not happening? There we go. Yeah. So one of the things. Um, I think can help us understand this is um, metapopulation theory. Um, metapopulation theory argues that, um, well, it was developed um, in the 70s and has been used by um, biologists and um, various other branches of science for quite a few years and is gradually kind of gaining um, steam in archaeology now. Um, and essentially what it is is a population of populations. So. It argues that each local population is susceptible to either stochastic extinction events or um, they'll fish in with another, uh, they'll fish in and split up, become two groups, or they'll fuse with another group if, um, if required to, so they can persist. Um, therefore, you can only understand populations on a, um, on a metapopulation level. Essentially, that is the only way that um, a population persists for a long period. Um, and work by um, Hopkinson in 2012 argued that um, that we can use this because they fulfil the criteria, um, which I won't go over now because they're not massively interesting. But there's four criteria that um, that have been laid out for to allow you to use metapopulation theory. Um, so if I can use metapopulation, quite a second, sorry. Uh, yeah. If we can use metapopulation, can I thought, well, maybe I could use an agent-based modelling to um, to look at how information might move within a metapopulation. Essentially, my theory is that what we see in the archaeological record when things don't persist is that a local population is coming up with a novel behaviour, but what is not happening is that that novel behaviour is not moving beyond the local population into the metapopulation. Um, because essentially the group who come up with it don't survive for long enough. So my challenge um, now is to try and build a model that represents that um, and explores that that kind of idea. So agent-based modelling, um, 
allows you to build a simple model which can model complex real-world phenomena, as I'm pretty sure Doug is going to um, talk about in a bit. Um, the plan is to get a selection of independent agents who perform a series of tasks every time step. So um, these agents live in a world uh, defined by a series of your rules you write. Um, and hopefully, it'll be possible for me to model transfers of information across across the meta population. So, to kind of guide my modelling slightly, I've come up with a few questions um, to look at how to essentially um, stop me getting carried away and just blindly coding forever. Um, firstly, how might seasonality work? Um, so, Central Europe is going to experience continental seasonality, which is of um, a far more extreme variation between winter and summer than you see in a coastal environment. So how did a change how might a change in seasonality affect um, how the agents behave um, as you move from summer to winter essentially? So it make it a lot harder for them to exist um, in a winter, in a continental climate, with continental seasonality, sorry. Um, and then um, and yeah, run the model and see what happens. Um, see how the population densities uh, might increase or decrease chances of group survival and um, how might rates of fission and fusion affect hominid networks. So if groups are moving together um, and joining up, how does that affect the cultural, um, the transmission of cultural information between the groups? So I've got a few challenges at the minute. Um, these aren't quite in the right order, mainly because I feel like making sure that the agents die is pretty key. And actually, in a few of the models that I've looked at, um, one of the, the they don't die. So they have um, groups of agents living in a world who can't die, which to me is kind of a bit of a it's a bit of a problem, really. Um, so yeah, that one really should be number one, to be honest. Um, and modelling, yeah, groups versus individuals. So there's a few models which look. At, I'd like to be able to look at both. The idea is that I want to be able to look at um, how information might or cultural knowledge and practice will grow within a group um, and then how that group might spread that information to other groups in the meta population. So at the minute I'm playing with the model and trying to get the groups to switch on and off across time steps so they'll go through a series of time steps and then vanish and then another group will appear and then as the time passes in the model they'll come together for um, like a seasonal event, possibly like a hunting reindeer, for example. Um, and then the groups will interact, and you can see a group level interaction rather than an individual person level interaction. Um, and yeah, how frequently should they interact? So these are all questions that are guiding my research at the minute, and um, things I'm kind of battling with. And yeah, the goal um, is to be able to scale it up to look at larger regions. So I think that the advantage of the agent-based model is that you can look at quite a small area and then hopefully with the model I'll be able to compare Central Europe with Western Europe and kind of challenge this idea that transitions are a thing that only happen on a broader scale and actually make it um, make it more interesting on a local level. So if you can look at a local transmission, uh, a local scale change, you can then scale up and see if the same factors are affecting things um, across a broader continental scale. Um, skip past that one. And then, yeah, some recent publications um, of stuff that look at agent-based models and also um, the lower to middle paleolithic transition, if anyone is interested. Thank you.